Hey guys, we have an amazing show. It's all about the secret of burning body fat. What is the answer? Is it insulin? Is it calories? Is it fasting? We're going to get to the bottom of this. So stay with me. Here we go. Let's begin with uh, one of my buddies, Sean Stevenson, Lewis Howell. Let's hear what Sean Stevenson has to say. Here we go. And before I go on, let me preface by saying this. Our fat is actually amazing. It's one of the most important things that have made us the humans that we are today is our ability to store energy and to go back and utilize that energy. Our fat is programmed to do what we've taught it to do. Mm. It's just doing what it's programmed to do. It's very good at it though. And it can be a little bit clingy, <laughs> you know, so you have to give the right messages and that's part mm. of the issue. So I just wanna make that clear. And fat is also, it's not, we tend to think it's like scattered droplets of, of cells or unhappiness throughout our body, but it's really an organ itself. So that it's a is an organ. It's an organ. It's huh. an organ that has this interconnected communication. And being that it's an organ, it produces its own hormones, all right? So it's like making, producing more hormones that encourage more fat storage if it gets out of hand. All right, so I want to preface by saying that. Wait, is it an organ or is it like an organ? It's an organ. Fat is an organ. Yes. In the, in yeah. Just like, for example. One, so fat in our body is one organ and it's all connected. From the brain it's in all my, connected. From the yeah. fat in my brain to my belly to my toe. Now there's different types of fat communities. Okay. All right. So this is another conversation. This, I go through all of these. I literally call it the fat communities in Eat Smarter wow. and break this stuff down. So there's another type of fat in the white adipose tissue camp that a lot of people don't know about. It's called intramuscular fat, all right? Intramuscular fat. Is this the third type of fat? Yeah, and so this type of fat really works on site to provide energy to your muscles. Now, when I went to school, mm -hmm. my conventional education, I really was indoctrinated with an idea that fat and muscle are kind of, they have this dichotomy, like they're two different things, they're separate, but they actually work together. And intramuscular fat really provides, and it, just to think about what it looks like, if you think about the marbling of a steak, mm, all right? That's, <laughs> that's, that's your intramuscular fat. Now that can get out of hand too, and you can get what we refer to as chubby muscles, mm. all right? With the intramuscular fat. So that's too much white adipose tissue storage on that particular fat community, all right? So these three are white adipose tissue. These are storage fats. Now here's what's really amazing, and a lot of folks might know about this next one, we also have body fat that burns fat. So they're not storage fats. These are fats that contribute to the burning of energy. The first one that's becoming a lot more recognizable is brown adipose tissue, all right, or BAT, brown adipose tissue or brown fat. Now brown fat, the reason that it's brown is that it's so dense in mitochondria, all right? Mitochondria, Which is mitochondria are good, right? Yeah, mitochondria are really the energy power plants of our cells, mm -hmm. really producing the energy. When we talk about having energy, th these are the power plants creating the energy. And mitochondria is where your fat actually gets burned, all right? So folks don't, we're, we're taught these like diet paradigms, like where the, how does it work? Where does the fat go? How does it get burned? Your mitochondria actually are the place where the triglycerides get shipped to, to actually burn them and use them as fat. So brown adipose tissue is brown because it's so dense in mitochondria. Side note, how, how do I go to bed weighing a certain amount and then I wake up and I lose two pounds? Where, where does that go? Is that Ooh. just a burn through sweat? Is that just <laughs> yeah. mitochondria burning and it's disintegrating into the air? What is happening? This is such a great question. So in Eat Smart, this is the first time in book form, like we're walking people through how the process of fat loss actually happens. Uh -huh. And it's just, the, the question should be like, where the hell does fat go? Where does like, it go? Does it go to a You just poop freaking, it out? Do you sweat it out? Does <laughs> you, it, you've got that, do uh, I breathe it in? You've got What's that it? Thanos keyche. <laughs> does it go to another dimension, exactly. you know what I mean? But what they did, when this was so fascinating, they actually tracked the path of fat getting burned throughout the body and tracked how it actually is eliminated. And so what they discovered was that about 84% of the fat, because, okay, we have to preface by saying this. For us psychologically, in our culture, we tend to think of burning fat, if there's a visual of it, it's sweating. Yeah. Like we're out there, we're at the gym, we're sweating it out. That's like, that's your fat cells crying. 
having a good breakup <laughs> cry, you know? That's how we, that's what we think. Yeah. But in actuality, about 84% of the fat that you lose or that you expel from your body is through breathing. What? Yeah, it's eliminated via your lungs. Yeah, it's carbon dioxide. So yeah. it, no way. So fat yeah, about burns 84%. in the body and then it goes what into your lungs? It's like transporting through the lung cavity and then you breathe it out? It's, it's an eliminatory organ, you know? We don't think about that. What? We tend to think about like our gastrointestinal tract, our bladder is eliminatory organs, your lungs. And so you breathe about 84% of the fat that you lose comes out via your, br your breath. And about a third <laughs> of that happens while you're, while you're sleeping, sleeping at night. Okay, that, that's a key point. 84% of your fat is essentially exhaled to carbon dioxide, and a third of it is burned during the time you sleep. So people think when they're perspiring at the gym, they literally think that, that perspiration is a sign they're burning more fat, when in reality, it's just they're overheating. It doesn't necessarily mean the fat is being transported to the mitochondria via the brown fat, uh, which has the most mitochondria, or into the muscle to burn fat. That's why I've always stated, you're actually going to burn more fat in the gym if you keep yourself extremely cool. I often go to the, uh, to the beach where it's really cool, the, the, the air, the breeze, the ocean breeze, and I'm lifting, and I, I don't even break a sweat but I'm burning fat at a much more rapid rate. In fact, I remember being in Youngstown, Ohio on the uh, balcony of a home of a good friend and I was lifting curl and presses while it was snowing and in the balcony, the snow wasn't falling on me, but it was that cold outside that it was snowing and I was burning tremendous amount of calories. Fat is very interesting. Let's proceed what's going so, on you breathe fat out that's how yeah. you burn it yeah 80 how much caesar milan is the dog whisperer yes yeah. you're I the fat whisperer <laughs> exactly <laughs> i burn it in my sleep um so wait a minute how much fat do we burn through our our lungs about 84 percent of it so uh, all of our fat so if i'm 100 but pounds, this is not the just <sighs> you're breathing it's all the metabolic processes that take place to create the metabolic kind of offshoots. It just comes waste. through the right, mouth. through the breathing. You also do eliminate some of body fat through fluids. So about, you know, somewhere around the ballpark of about 15%, 16 to 14% sweat, and urine, bathroom. yeah, yeah. tears. <laughs> you can even, all of these things are, are eliminating uh, fat products. Fat you know? yeah. is, it, is the fat, it looks coagulated when you look at it in like a, in your body, right? So how does it, break down yeah. and then turn into just nothing that you can see. Yeah, it's, it looks it's, like, you know. it's a very complex and beautiful process. The body is fascinating. Yeah. It's really cool to understand the rate at which fat burns. And we know that there's certain activities, there's certain way to eat to maximize fat burning. And I know they're gonna come up with an idea or a concept, but I'm gonna give you what I know to be very true of how to get ripped abs and firm thighs. So stay with me. This is uh, going to be a lot of fun as we understand how uh, fat transports into the bloodstream, actually starts through the lymphatics, and we see droplets of fat called triglycerides in the background of the red blood cells, if you will. And we're looking at a sample of blood right now. Uh, it's quite fascinating to understand this. Fat itself when it gets excessively high in the form of triglycerides, it coats the blood cells and it thickens them. That's why I tell people it's not smart to drink olive oil. There's a guy out there, uh, Gun Gundry, who's talking about drinking olive oil and how the health benefits. Look, you can rub olive oil on your skin and get benefit and absorb. When you drink it, it not only clumps up your immune system because it starts out through the lymphatics, lymphatic duct, but it pours into the general circulation and high triglycerides desensitizes the insulin. Insulin can't push sugar into the cells and you have sugar diabetes. These people are confused and they're wrong. So they're right about some things, but let's go back to the story here. This is, this is fun. Yeah, yeah. It is, it is. And we go through, we, and it can be so overwhelming, but what I did was I made it an analogy in the book of a theater, making your body like a cellular movie theater. 
And there are particular ushers who are there to put fat into the seats. So we tend to think that fat cells, we're trying to quote, kill fat or burn fat, but that's not really how it works actually. Your fat cells are storage containers and what they're getting filled with, the fat cells, basically when you're, when you're born, you have a certain allotment of fat cells, all right? You can't just indiscriminately kill them. They get filled with more and more energy. It makes the fat cell expand. So what we're trying mm -hmm. to do is to get the fat cell to let go of its contents <clears throat> mm -hmm. so they can be used as fuel. Right. Now, he's absolutely right about that. Fat cells, you're born with a certain number of fat cells. And I reported this in my book, uh, Weight Loss and Energy Now, years ago. And I have to say that that prediction and that science is still the same as it is today. Literally, like my brother, who's like very thin and lean, has less than probably 30 billion fat cells. A person who tends to retain weight and gain weight easily could have 100 billion fat cells. But a massively obese person who can store a lot more fat, eating the same food, would essentially have almost 300 billion fat cells. Fat cells are adipose tissues. They are an organ, as was stated. And you need to learn how to release the fat. And it's not just caloric reduction it really does require an understanding of hormone biochemistry but let's go further this this is good for the lay public for you to understand and i think you're going to appreciate some of the explanations and i'll help to define them and clarify them all right, all right. and so there are two enzymes that are really the head ushers that push fats the the fat contents or triglycerides into the fat cell or they usher them out when it's time to leave so one of his hormone sensitive lipase is the one that comes and gets folks out of the theater, all right? Lipoprotein lipase takes the triglycerides and ushers them into the theater, all right? And then there's organs that kind of dominate and regulate what those enzymes are doing, you know? Namely, your, your, your pancreas is like the mother of two brothers who have two different roles. One of them is insulin, mm -hmm. and the other one, its brother, is glucagon, all right? Insulin is so, man, when you think of insulin, what do you think of, though? Eating sugar? Yeah. That's what right, I think right. of, because insulin spikes in the body when you eat sugar, right? Yeah, and most folks think of diabetes too. It's like tied right. into that right. lexicon. Of course. But insulin is so important for our survival. It's just, it's a super amazing. We need it. Yes, you absolutely have to have insulin. And what's amazing is that in most cases of type 2 diabetes, the individual is producing more than enough insulin. In fact, in many cases, they're producing more insulin than a normal individual. But that excess insulin is being produced because the insulin they have isn't effective, it's not sensitive, and not able to push glucose into the cells. Why? Because separated process oils, excess calories, excess sugar, but mostly excess fat that's marbled within the meat, that's within the fatty fish. That's, oh, fatty fish. Yeah, yeah, but I was told to eat salmon. Wait a minute. Eating more and more salmon and gaining more body fat, you're not going to probably burn that many calories. You're already overweight. Get on a sequencing program, and you're going to burn that fat. And I'll explain sequencing with vegetables, fruit, and uh, beans and, and potatoes and so forth here in a little bit, but let, let's go back to uh, what he's saying. This is, this is good for you to understand. And if you're born, you know, in a condition where you have type 1 diabetes and the beta cells in your pancreas aren't even making insulin, like you can die. Your cells won't get energy. So, yeah, type, type 1 diabetes um, are not producing enough insulin, partly because uh, an autoimmune disease, oftentimes Dr. Neil Bernard had stated uh, dairy product can cause a destruction of the pancreas and the, and the beta cells to produce insulin. So again, an animal diet is not the way to go. It can worsen both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And there's even a type 3 when you consider uh, the insulin resistance. But let's, let's continue uh, with our conversation here. So now here's the thing. Insulin's job is to store energy, Bad. right? Yeah, and to encourage all those enzymes and to do their work as well. So when it's out of hand, when insulin is too active, 
it can be a problem. It's storing too much fat. Yeah, and it can get to a point where there's so much activity with insulin, it's getting overrun and, and stressed out that it stops doing its job properly. That's where you get insulin resistance. <clears throat> yeah, so once again, the insulin resistance has really been shown in many cases to be uh, excess circulating fat and excess body fat. And the reality is that individuals who fast for their blood test, it really represents an artificial situation. They're walking in, not having eaten, they're going to show lower levels, but it's really good to get used to periodically checking insulin, glucose, and triglycerides in the middle of the day, the course of the day. That's why oftentimes I'll switch people to take a look at their own blood under a microscope. Blood doesn't lie. As you know, I wrote the book uh, on the subject, Blood Doesn't Lie, based on over 40 years of looking at lipids, lipid metabolism, glucose, good and bad cholesterol, triglycerides, C-reactive protein, hemoglobin A1C. These are just part of many factors. And the exciting thing is there are solutions. And again, uh, it's good to bring it simplified as we're discussing here. And this, this is uh, helping you, I'm sure. So here we go. All right. Mm. And then you have something called um, uh, this kind of instant cell, fat cell creation that can take place with the liver. It'll just start making its own fat as well. So, but we'll circle back to that a little bit later. Yes. But here's the thing. So you got insulin doing its job of fat storage or energy storage. Glucagon does the opposite. It encourages your cells to let go of their contents to be used as energy. But glucagon cannot do its job when, unless his brother sits his ass down somewhere and insulin. stops. Yes. So how do you yeah. get... So one of the exciting things is that maintaining low good levels of insulin so glucagon can release the fat to be burned is to really get an idea of taking in your food in a sequence that has the least amount of caloric density but the most amount of nutritional value and that always is and always will be begin with eating your vegetables it's been shown later in the show they mentioned one serving of vegetable a day can reduce a full body size for an individual. That is how effective vegetables are. Imagine two, three, four, five servings of vegetables. I try and take in 10 to 15 to 20 servings of vegetables a day. And then followed by fruit. Yes, fruit, even though it has sugar in it. It's very low in fat. It's high in what's called polyphenols that stabilizes blood sugar levels. So these are just some of the things these guys aren't talking about or maybe they don't fully appreciate from the science. But let's go back on the subject here. Here we go. Get insulin to stop doing its job. That's what it's all about, man. That's what it's all about. <laughs> but we don't want it to stop. We just want it to be efficient. Efficient. And it's now here's another thing. We do know that, as you mentioned, sugar is a big driver of insulin, mm -hmm. carbohydrates in general. Yeah. Breads, However, pastas, right? Yeah, protein, but protein does as well. It incites really? the activity of, of insulin at a lesser degree for sure. Okay, so he at, at least admitted that protein can negatively, harmfully affect insulin. Uh, Lewis Howell was jumping in. Uh, Howell was, was essentially saying that carbohydrates and pasta... If the pasta is whole grain pasta, it, it, it can have a beneficial and stabilizing effect. Just when you make the spaghetti sauce, <laughs> use a fat-free marinara tomato sauce base. Then you have a good situation. But I would even go so far if you're overweight to use spaghetti squash, which is a vegetable, yellow vegetable. It comes out kind of like the texture a little bit and looking like spaghetti and the texture of, and you just put the fat-free marinara spaghetti sauce and you're, you're gonna be doing much better. So again, this is some of the things you can do in route to correcting diabetes, stabilizing insulin, and more importantly, reducing body fat, the subject of our show today. And even fat in a kind of backdoor way does drive insulin function too, or even contributes to potentially insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance. So it's not just this one thing, but we do know that in our culture, you know, on average, folks are eating like 150 pounds of sugar a year, you know, so. Isn't that shocking? The average person does eat 150 pounds of sugar per year per person. What he didn't mention is usually when they're eating the sugar, it's combined with fat, which makes it a double harmful effect. Fat and sugar together, fat desensitizing, make the insulin not work properly. Even if you just took in the sugar, it would actually 
get pushed into the cells because insulin can usually do its job, even in the face of excess sugar. But when you add the fat, that is the biggest factor. And protein. Fat and protein tends to really work against the proper function of insulin. Insulin also is not only fat producing in excess, it is a highly anabolic. It builds muscle as well. And that hasn't been mentioned at all. Uh, people with deficient insulin levels are skinny, they're slender, they can't form hips or thighs, uh, get any size to their chest, both men and women, if you will. So let's, let's go further. That abnormal amount of exposure is chronically creating this over, overactivity of insulin to the, to the point that we have insulin resistance. Because right. 100 years ago, we weren't eating as much sugar, I'm assuming, in yeah. processed oh It's not even close. So I think one of the exciting things is to recognize that we basically have a heavily processed food diet in America and increasingly worsening around the world. Uh, we believe there's a lot of great solutions. And I wanted to jump back to... Uh, a um, good good discussion here with Dr. Alan uh, Goldhammer. So let's. What let's... could it be? The richest, most valuable years of your life, the last ten or twenty years of your life, uh, give them up essentially because of short-term pleasure-seeking, self-indulgent behavior that leads you into becoming debilitated unnecessarily. Uh, so we want, to, yeah, we want people to live their full life potential yeah. and take advantage of that. That, that, that's powerful. Let me ask you, SOS, sh uh, salt, oil, sugar, versus cocaine, pot, ecstasy, Vicodin, heroin, special, I mean, you can go on with all the other uh, addictions that people, alcohol, cigarettes, whatever else we want to add to that. What is more addicting, SOS or all the other drugs? Well, the, the other drugs are more powerful, and so they're more, uh, it's, it's easier to get addicted. Uh, the, that process is more intense. Uh, but the SOS is much more insidious because at least when people are snorting cocaine or shooting heroin, uh, they're usually not in denial of the fact that they're utilizing a drug that has negative consequences. They may not be able to choose to stop or control it easily, but they're not uh, deluded into thinking that there's not a problem. There. Most smokers know the smoking is going to kill them. It's a problem. Um, with, uh, with the salt, oil, and sugar, people think this is a normal thing that everybody eats salt, oil, and sugar, that it's normal to be overweight, uh, to be obese, to develop. Everybody has heart disease and diabetes. And it's just an, so it's, in some ways, it's more insidious, even though it's certainly not as powerful as some of the, the drugs are. Uh, and it works on the same neurochem neurochemical cascade of the same pathways. And so it's not that uh, sugar is as bad as cocaine. It's not. Uh, but over the long run, it can be even more uh, uh, devastating in the sense that um, you don't have to uh, take drugs, but you do have to eat. And if you don't understand the difference between a health promoting diet and a conventional diet, it's, it's even worse than that because we're teaching people they need to eat meat, fish, fowl, eggs, dairy products, that everybody needs milk. There's all kinds of forces at play convincing people that if they don't use these animal based products or these highly processed foods, they're going to be def deficient in things, that they're actually going to develop problems. People literally worry about adopting a healthier whole plant food diet because they think they're going to be missing out on some criti critical issue. And that's part, in part because we've done a really effective job marketing and advertising these products. So, I mean, you've really got to admire the people that have, you know, uh, sold uh, people uh, this concept that these highly processed fractionated food products are actually necessary and even important to sustain health doesn't mean it's true, but it's certainly been an effective campaign. We've been convinced, though. I mean, if you think about it, the world's been convinced that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's good. You said, you said it was three reasons why people come to you, the, the three types of people. You said pain, fear of death, and debility. What was the other one you and said? Debility, yeah. Oh, okay, so got either it. they can't do what they want to do, they, they, can't, they can't tolerate the pain, you know, the pain's big, or they're, they're, for whatever reason, they've decided they want to stay alive. M makes sense. I mean, it's, it's a good reason to want to stay alive and maybe see your grandkids grow up and your kids grow up. But the, what, what gets people to a level from your experience, 36 years? 20 so think about it. We have grown up in a world where the media, just like with the media being allowed to advertise cigarette smoking, and we finally recognized 
the hazards of cigarette smoking and the high rate of cardiovascular death due to cigarette smoking and cancer. Oh, far more people die from heart disease related to cigarette smoking because it lowers the oxygen levels and the blood vessels open up and lets the cholesterol into the arteries and it forms these inflammatory markers and inflames uh, the macrophages. It's a horrible problem. Far more die from coronary heart disease due to cigarette smoking than do die of cancer and lung cancer. But I could go further and say most of the people, most deaths in the world occur from excess. I'm going to start with protein because you think in terms of eating protein, protein is high in fat and cholesterol, has no fiber, animal protein specifically. And that should not be allowed to be advertised and portrayed as a health food because of the protein benefits of building what? Building muscle? No, building fat people. <laughs> We're like gorillas, uh, bonobos monkeys. We can take fruits, vegetables, beans, peas, yams, and so forth, and convert that into muscle and with physical activity be exactly at the right weight. What Alan, Go uh, uh, what Alan is talking about is, Goldhammer that is, is the use of SOS, salt, oil, and sugar-free. And the salt mainly because it causes you to probably eat too, too much of the particular salted french fries, if you will. I would agree. But I would say more importantly, it'd be SOP, sugar-free, oil-free, and protein-free. You get all the protein you need in plant, whole, natural foods. You don't have to add animal protein. That would solve a majority of cancers and heart disease. That's a bold statement but you're going to go on to see their solution is put people on fasting. Fasting, sure, humans can fast. It's uncomfortable. It, it, it's, I remember when I was a kid trying to make wanes for football, you know, 12 years old, and I was a big kid, five foot eight. I weighed 150 some pounds, and I had to get down to 115, a 35 pound drop in weight within only a month or so. Well, I had to starve myself. I fasted almost every day while running. Usually at these uh, fasting centers, they fast under non-exercise conditions. They're required to lay in bed, bed rest, because fasting can be risky and dangerous. So the general public's out there eating a lot of protein, a lot of animal product, and then they're told to fast so to solve that problem. I think they need to get directly to the cause of the problem. Let's go a little further here. 20,000 plus patients, fasting all the way up to 40 days. Uh, uh, what gets people to the point of saying, you know what, Doc, I got to tell you, I know those three things you talked about. Is that the breaking point where somebody says, I'm willing to change and figure out a way to drop some of these SOSs and, and, and change my lifestyle? Is it anything more than those three things that you see where somebody just says, I want to make a change in my life? Um, yeah, I think sometimes their experience of people they know or trust and they see them having had an experience, that's very motivating. Um, so, you know, they know somebody that had problems like they had and then they, they see them go through what appears to be a relatively straightforward process. You know, you adopt a healthy diet, you get enough rest, you do your exercise and the body heals itself. And if you want to speed it up, we do this, this fasting business. Okay, so I like how he positioned it. He said, look, you get a healthy diet, which is defined as what I've been teaching for a better part of 44 years, Simply Healthy. My cookbook explains oil-free, sugar-free, uh, little or no animal protein, essentially plant-based. It works. You don't have to fast. But he's saying some people want to speed up the process. Now, there is truth that many people have addictions and they can't control themselves and those people are potentially a candidate uh, to fast but listen he's saying fast for two days three days five days the longest fasting period as much as 40 days on a straight water fast and the water is purified reverse osmosis so it has nothing in it to help attach to all the chemicals and toxins now i must say his success record 
is he's never had a person die. <laughs> That's pretty good. And imagine he's had some pretty serious health uh, challenges. I like True North Health because they uh, work with Dr. Michael Clapper. Dr. Michael Clapper was a doctor that worked with me in the 1980s in Torrance, California at Delgado Medical. I'm quite proud to have had that history after being trained with Nathan Pritikin as a mentorship and learning. But we saw miraculous results. No one had to fast. Again, if it's life and death and, and the person is just so addicted they can't change their habits, sure, fasting can make sense. I, I, I share this with you because people are you know, desperate. There, there is no pill, potion, powder product. There's no... I say they're, they're desperate, but how shall I say? At the same time... Magic. These are... I, I think we have to look at the reality and the reality is this, that more and more people are looking for solutions. My gosh, you, you look at this, uh, Jason Fong, he, he's a kidney specialist. Here, uh, um, we're going to jump in because he, he's talking constantly about insulin and fasting and weight loss. And again, there's a place for it and it can make sense. Let's, let's jump in. Because both conditions are conditions where we have too much insulin in our body. So we want to lower insulin overall because insulin is one of the main causes of the fertilizer for cancer to potentially grow. Exactly. And, and, and there's several ways to do that. One is to change either the foods that you eat, and that is the sugar, for example, the refined carbohydrates that make up the bulk of our diet. And the other thing is to change the frequency with which you eat because you can affect both things. So just like if you're, for example, to pay, you know, $10 and you pay it every day, it adds up quickly, right? If you have a cost. So I, I would agree. You have to eliminate not just the sugars. He's not touching on this clearly. The oils and fats must be eliminated as well. And the frequency, that's based on what we call intuitive eating. Just because it's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you're going to have like a big meal of animal product, dairy and meat and cheese and pizza and everything, yeah, you're going to have to go longer between meals. But when you're doing plant-based foods, after about three, four, five months, you're not hungry. You're just finding you're needing, you're, you're getting the signal that you could eat more often, and it's okay to, especially when it's in sequence of vegetables, then fruit, then, then grains and beans. We use supplements. I find them extremely helpful. Whole, organic, herbal supplements. Herbs have been used since the beginning of time. They're very effective, and they help to stabilize blood sugar incredibly well. DocNutrients.com, um, I'll just mention just as a brief sponsor, has um, come together with this incredible product line that helps to stabilize blood sugar because it has lycopene, yes, from tomatoes, a special type. It has berberin and bergamante. Just those three herbs alone, along with about 20 other herbs together in heart insulin stability is one of the best solutions. So rather than jumping into a fasting bandwagon, which is risky, and if you're going to do fasting, it better be under medical supervision. They charge about, I don't know, $150, $200 a day for 30 days. That's kind of steep. You get a bottle of heart insulin stability for, you know... Less, you get three bottles that last year, um, you know, three months uh, for the cost of one day at one of these fasting centers. Just think about it, guys. There's solutions. Thanks to our sponsor, Doc Nutrients. Let's return. Coffee every day, and it's like, you know, five or seven bucks at Starbucks. Every day, every day, every day, it adds up. So just like that, it's not just the amount that you're paying, which is not much, but it's the frequency, right? Same thing with the foods. It's not just the, the amount that you eat or what it is that you eat. It's how often you eat it. So if you're eating now six, eight times a day, well, that's a lot worse if you ate once a day, right? That's just basic math. Like you can't. Yeah. Hold on. Uh, there's examples of sumo wrestlers who eat only once a day, and their strategy is to eat one big meal a day, and their body thinks it's starving. And when they do eat, all these hormones release to kind of retain fat. Sumo wrestlers, that's their strategy. They can get three, four hundred pounds, 500 pounds. So he might say it makes logical sense. You know, six meals, eight meals is far worse than eating one meal. No. If you're hungry and if you're eating very high nutrient dense, low caloric, density, i.e. vegetables, fruit, soups, salads, 
That's the category. Add some beans, high in fiber. They stabilize blood sugar. Every study shows the longest lived people in the blue zones live longer. This is well known. So you can't just assume what these guys are saying is always true, but it's worth listening. Yeah. Get around that. And the problem is, of course, that if you look at how people eat today compared to sort of 1970, it's very different. So in 1970, people ate three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. No snacks. Nobody ate snacks back then. Now it's a snack eat. culture, like <laughs> it's a snacking snack all culture. day. Exactly. And people say it's good for you. People say, oh, you should eat multiple times in the day, six times a day. It's good for you. But nobody in the history of humanity has done that before. I disagree strongly. Yeah, I grew up in the 70s. I was born in 1955. We ate when we ate, uh, depended on the individual. It's really what you eat. Look, our relatives, bonobos, monkeys, gorillas, they forage throughout the day. Primitive cultures in Africa, they forage and eat large quantities a couple times a day, and they exercise, but it's all fibrous plant-based foods. The frequency with which you eat should be dependent on that sense of feeling that little bit of drop in blood sugar, not to the point where you're getting hunger pangs and you're weak and empty. Sure, when you do eat, practice like the Japanese, hari hashibu, eat up till you're 80% satisfied, then stop eating. Let the calories come in, fuel your body, get the blood sugar to stabilize. I look at people's blood sugar levels on a regular basis. I've looked at tens of thousands of people's blood sugar for the last 44 years. And I know what they eat. I know their activities. This guy's wrong, okay? I'm going to be very blatant. The people, though, who are eating high animal products, meat, cheese, eggs, dairy product, yeah. They better limit their intake maybe down to one or two meals a day. I'm not advocating that. And neither is um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Alan uh, Goldhammer. So, so let, let's jump over here because we had work to do, right? Here, here we go. I'm going to go back to, because I, I think it's important to get this, 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 this contrast. Yeah, here we go. Jump a little ahead. Unpack your reaction. It'd be very helpful. Well, my brother is five years older than I am. So we grew up together. And, you know, I got involved in this very young. I wanted to be a, a better basketball player because my best friend, Doug Lyle, used to beat me just mercilessly. And I thought, well, you know, I practiced. It didn't do any good. I thought maybe I'd get healthier and that would give me an edge and I would crush him. Well, the problem was it failed because he adopted the same diet. And he still, to this day, I'm 61 years old. We go out, we play competitive basketball. He still kicks my rear every time. <laughs> so complete failure. But it got me interested. I started reading and I read these books and they said that doctors that use this approach had the best job in the whole world because the body did all the healing and the patient had to do all the work. And all you had to do as a doctor was take credit for the good results. And I thought, that's the job for me. You know, I got interested in it. And so, uh, you know, started to pursue this. Anyway, my brother, you know, he continued to live more of a conventional lifestyle. Really brilliant guy, but, you know, he ate too much, gained weight, got to the point where his knees were swollen. He couldn't play volleyball anymore, really starting to suffer. And, of course, I would always give him, you know, a hard time. Yeah, yeah, he didn't want to hear about it. At one point, my sister-in-law, his wife gets ill, comes to our facility, does a fast, recovers, avoids surgery, does great, becomes a, a, adopts a health-promoting diet. He still won't do it. She's wow. having to make two meals. He's making... She's You're the younger doing, brother. I mean, I don't want to listen to him. He doesn't want to listen. Brother. A buddy of his, he's, he's uh, at, one of, at, uh, at, at uh, Boeing. So he's, you know, one of his buddies from Boeing. Actually, unbeknownst to him, comes to our facility, recovers his health, quits smoking, gets, overcomes his blood pressure, gets off the drugs, goes home and starts to tell my brother... You should go to this place, True North. It was really helpful. He said, oh, it's my brother. Won't do it. Finally, I get the call. He's in the hospital. He says, Alan, I've had a heart attack. And I said, well, you survived it. That's wonderful. And he goes, no, no, no. You don't understand. I had a heart attack. I said, I heard you. Best thing that could have happened. Now you're going to have to start to listen. So the, the, the surgeon is telling him he's got to have a, a four-way bypass. And I asked him to talk to the surgeon. The surgeon, he asked the surgeon, if I do this, won't they eventually plug up again? 
And the surgeon explains, yeah, they will plug up again, but it'll last much longer than if we just do stents and whatever. Anyway, long story short, he checks himself out. He adopts a health-promoting diet and lifestyle. He loses 50 pounds. He avoids the procedure. He's able to get He's passed his stress test. He's had a great outcome. And now he's, you know, he's adopted the diet and lifestyle. Took me, you know, took him having a heart attack and me 30 years of nagging. But nonetheless, uh, today he looks fabulous and he's doing really well. It's been a couple of years now. He's back playing volleyball. Everything looks good. I love that story. And by the way, I have a brother, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to rag on him. I, I nagged him just like Alan Goldhammer, seeing how he ate, seeing how he had gained weight. And I got the call. Your brother has had a heart attack and he needs to have bypass surgery. Wow. I called him up. I said, let me talk to the surgeon. Um, and as it happened, the surgeon kind of avoided talking to me or maybe my brother didn't have me talk to him and they cracked open my brother's chest in the morning did surgery they rushed him in as if it was an emergency well he'd been eating this way his whole life but he didn't want to hear me nagging has he changed his diet now not sure but look at alan goldhammer he's changed his brother's diet and it took a heart attack to catch his attention I love my brother. I love my family. And I only nag them. Now I've learned not to nag. I just lead by example. And when they get in trouble or, or health problem, I'm there for them. But you can use neuro reprogramming. I just released a session tonight and we're going to put it available in our coaching program because most of this is subconscious training related to the media. To, you have to override this harmful conditioning. I, I'm going to read a, a, a few comments here. Uh, Adriana says, I would say that we need to avoid SOAP for soap, sugar, oil, animal protein. I love that. Hey, can I borrow that for all the future shows? Sugar, oil, animal protein. So much more important than SOS. Yes, right on. Good call. The next one, Dr. Delgado, extra virgin olive oil, yay or nay? Nay. Girl, guy, listen. It's marketing, extra virgin, <laughs> like as if it's like some pristine. Look, it's like saying sugar beets, pulling sugar out of the beets and going extra virgin sugar. Would you buy into that? You're not stupid. You're not stupid when it comes to sugar because you know sugar's bad and everyone, everyone lashes out against sugar because it's easy to be the fall guy, but it's not the biggest problem. It's one of four SOAP, sugar, oil, animal protein. Animal protein's worse than even the sugar. And depending on how much oil you use, it's actually worse. So I would flip it around because animal protein's high in cholesterol, which clogs the arteries, and high in fat, ha lacks fiber, and then the oil lacks fiber, the oil desensitizes insulin, and then the sugar gets worsened, goes into the, uh, it doesn't get into the, the, the tissues, it goes into the general circulation and out the urine, and you have sugar diabetes. I wish they would get this straight. Alan Gold, Goldhammer's as close as you can get. He, he works with Michael Clapper, who worked for me back in Torrance in the 1980s. So I'm really proud to have lived long enough to see all of these things, and Let's, uh, let, let's jump back to that segment uh, here a moment. Well, I mean, you said you were 61. Let's, let's, I, I want to go back to, um, I like what Sean Stevenson is, is leading up to here. And, and I think we, we get a lot of information on, on the secret of fat burning here. So here we go. Okay, here we go. The fat. And the browning of this fat, one of the things, and I'll just throw this out there for folks since you asked about a specific uh, food, when we go through so many different, but I'm, I'm gonna throw one out that might sound a little bit crazy, a little controversial, is coffee. Coffee has been found to encourage your beige fat cells to become brown fat cells. And in fact, one of the studies that I cited in Eat Smarter found, they actually used uh, fMRI and they looked at what was happening in the body when somebody drank coffee 
and they saw the brown fat areas of the body actually light up, wow. signaling increased thermogenesis. And one of the studies found that there's about a three to 11% increase in metabolic rate from having caffeine. Now, there's a U-shaped curve of benefits, right? right, right. Some is good, once we get to a certain place, we it's can mess bad. ourselves up. Yeah, yeah. And also we get in the conversation of what is that coffee coming along with, right? Is it just, is it coffee or are you consuming coffee with- Donuts and yeah. <laughs> crap. <laughs> and like, you know, these car coffee creamers with all these mm, synthetic chemicals. That is, that is not good. And even the coffee itself, are you getting a piping hot cup of coffee with pesticides and herbicides and rodenticides? Yeah, I would have to say that the use of coffee specifically, as he stated, because people put cream and sugar and all these things on it, we we have utilized extreme energy product um, with our sponsor, Doc Nutrients. And this is a very pure form of caffeine, and it does accelerate the rate of fat burning. I had a really incredible personal experience. I'm one of these kind of guys that I can approach my ideal body weight, but to actually have ripped abs, <laughs> that's almost a very, very challenging thing uh, in my experience. However, when I do curl and presses, go to the beach, train each day, and as I do tend to keep up my workout routine and I eat healthy on a regular basis, sequencing my foods, following essentially the Simply Healthy cookbook uh, recipes and guidelines. But more importantly, if I really want to accelerate that rate of fat burning, I take on the product Extreme Energy. Uh, it really does work. And it's like 12 hours of energy from one capsule. Personally, I take the capsule and open it and put like a fifth, maybe a third mixed in some juice or water because it's so potent, but it does burn fat. And it's got other really cool things, guarana, because that's where the caffeine derivative comes from. Uh, it, it's got uh, various other very key herbs that increase metabolism and burn fat very effectively. Plus, while we're talking about burning fat, you want to metabolize fat, and the liver is part of that, and that's why we have liver excel that helps to accelerate the rate at which liver processes the biochemistry and helps acts, actually helps to burn fat. It helps to reduce the conversion of, of testosterone to estrogen, and estrogen is highly fat retention, retaining, just like uh, insulin in excess can be. So... I hope you're enjoying this show. Uh, this is a fun show for me to share details with you. Let's let's go back with and some these more. toxicants that damage these hormones related to fat loss and fat storage and create kind of dysbiosis mm. in the gut. So there's a big conversation there, and we dive into all these pieces to see like there's so many wonderful things that we have access to, but in our culture we've been a little bit led astray mm -hmm. and. It's not that coffee is inherently good or bad. It's been utilized for, by humans for centuries. But it's the quality and how you're going about it that can make all the difference. And the, the quantity world. probably. And yeah. Yeah. Yes. So it's really uh, helpful to, to hear the concept of health and nutrition and well-being. And there's some great ways to accelerate fat burning. And another way is running, exercise, high intensity, fast, rapid. That burns fat really nicely, much more than aerobics. You want to build muscle and burn fat. You want to increase that intensity, particularly adding weight training. But here, let's let's go back here. Where the cell walls become harder to break into, all right? So just right off the bat, baby spinach versus the same quantity of mature spinach, you're going to get more calories out of the baby spinach. Is that better for you or? It, this is not about better or worse right okay. now. This is just like understanding there's some other stuff happening. Interesting, okay. Now, but here's another thing. Cooking the spinach too breaks down the cell wall. So regardless if it's a baby spinach, cooked spinach, I mean a mature spinach. And when this happens, it also, the density of the spinach. Like you've seen it, you can- Shrinks, cook, whole bag. Right, <laughs> comes this little teeny baby <laughs> teaspoon, right? And so this is one of the things, and I really start the book talking about this, that most experts will agree that it was our ability to cook that really created like a quantum leap in the evolution of the human brain. Because we're now able to extract more nutrients and, and calories from our food, even though this, this term wasn't invented yet. Mm. Not to say that it's good or bad or that raw food isn't good. It's just understanding when you, how the food is prepared changes what calories do in your body. Okay, 
I don't think that's a good example because even if you did cook a whole bag of spinach and it got to be really small, spinach has hardly any calories and it has fiber and there's no uh, hormonal uh, alterations except for beneficial hormonal improvements. So eat all the cooked vegetables you want, all the raw vegetables you want, all the cooked soup that you want so long as it's oil-free and soap. (laughs) free of of sugar, oil, and animal protein. That is your solution, guys and gals. It makes a huge difference. I look at people's blood under the microscope virtually every day of the week. My staff works closely working with uh, this process uh, as I'm the face of, 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 of the shows. You know, of course, I'm one that advocates sponsors and great thought thoughts thought leaders and considerations but let, let's go back further here this is this is fun incredible ecology this this dynamic uh plethora of microbes that inhabit our bodies that are in and on our bodies even right now dude you got like 400 trillion viruses yeah i know the viruses are on people's mind bugs right all, all over the body over Isn't that crazy you. 400 trillion and many of them are opportunistic right but that means that when you're compromised they can take control. But the thing is, why are they around? They all play a role. It's not good or bad. It's about us being in a good state of health because viruses have actually helped us to evolve as humans. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, when the human genome was decoded, they found that humans, the human gene itself is 8% virus. Okay, I, I hope you heard that. The human genome is 8% virus. We require viruses to genetically evolve and grow and develop as humans. What he's saying is microbes are necessary to reduce fat. Healthy microbes, sure there's some opportunistic microbes we know, but it, the body lives in balance and the more vegetables and fruit and soups and salads and whole foods you eat, the healthier you'll be. Huge difference. Things that the research is showing is that One of the most remarkable things in association with fat loss and weight loss is associated with having a higher diversity of of microbes in your gut, specifically bacteria. The higher the diversity, the lower your body weight and body fat percentage, the correlation. The problem is here in the Western world, our diversity of our microbes is just like, we've got a lot of endangered species and a lot of things are extinct versus folks who are in more of a kind of an indigenous culture. A plethora of fruits and vegetables and yeah. uniqueness, right? Yeah. It, up to, somewhere around four times as many different microbes, right? So take yours, multiply it times four, the different, um, the different species of microbes, mm-hmm. all right? So in the Western world, our, our diversity is going down. And this is also associated with the, some of the problems we're seeing that we don't, we think it's just associated to, it's, it's People are, they don't have willpower, end of story. Right, right. But here. All right, so what we're saying is biodiversity. Eat a huge variety of fruits and vegetables and beans and peas and whole grains and nutrient-rich foods, herbs and supplements, and all these things contribute. Blood doesn't lie. I've, I, I was with one of my friends just a few days ago, and she was saying, God, I want to lose weight again fast because... <laughs> either, well, not sure, you know, what food pattern she's been following, but she wanted to eat the banana diet. Banana diet? Okay. Why? Because you have to have diversity. Just bananas, or like Walter Kempner proved, you eat rice and fruit. At least with fruit, there's a variety of fruit. But you want a variety of whole, nutritious, all the colors in the rainbow. Now, it could be, you could be, slightly sensitive to some of these foods make sure they're as organic as possible because of the genetic modified organisms that affect the gut but really biodiversity helps you to reduce fat increase energy lose weight balance your hormones and improve the outcome of a better quality life i think we said it all this is dr nick delgado I'm so proud to say our sponsor is DocNutrients.com. Check them out, DocNutrients.com. Say Dr. Nick said to visit, and uh, I think you're going to 
be pleasantly surprised. These products were formulated by doctors, created for doctors and their patients, and now finally available to the world. And we're getting them out. We're going to make everyone aware that these are the highest quality, nutrient-rich herbs and supplements you could ever get. And we have to change the philosophy of the world. The world has been brought to their knees. The world has only two solutions. I won't mention what those are, but one has to do with the V and a shot in the arm. And the other one has to do with um, preventing us from being around other humans. You need biodiversity. Being around other humans is important. Your strongest immune system. If you roll around in the dirt, even a stronger immune system. You can do it, folks. Nick Delgado coming to you live and just check out nickdelgado.com. We finally have our first candidates coming in, eligibility, coaching eligibility, and you just fill out a short few questions. We evaluate what your goals and we guide you via Zoom and follow up uh, some small group sessions and one on one. Now's your chance to take advantage of being the very best you could possibly be. Thank you, everyone. Be well, be strong, looking great, feeling great at your ideal.